Hello. Everyone's gonna see the MK Institute. Know the type of country we have. That's the sound. Every country has it. All right, let's just move. Can you turn it up a little bit? All right. Know the type of. Good. All right, cool. And then, um, static from the first one, voice for any users right here over. You can just click the from beginning, it'll yeah, rewind. Yeah. Click the red button. All right, and until Felicity gives you the live, we're not you live. You can sit, take a seat. <coughs> Hotel. 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 It's so good to see all y'all. Very good. We're, we're, we're getting, we're getting, getting there, we're doing wonderful. And so we're happy to invite you here and invite all of our uh, guests who are uh, in various parts of the world who are with us today. We welcome you to the Malefic Hete Asante uh, Institute at 5535 Germantown Avenue. And we're just really delighted uh, that uh, we are emerging out of COVID very strongly. And it's very good to see you and to see even members of our board. We're really happy to see them here as well. So I just want to tell you that we have um, a great uh, speaker coming up also on the 23rd of October. 23rd of October, uh, Dr. Uh, Zizwe Po, who is a professor of history at Lincoln University. Uh, and a very strong uh, member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party who worked with uh, Kwame Torre and, and many other uh, uh, activists and scholars to bring into existence the United States of Africa, uh, will be speaking here at 4 o'clock on October the 23rd. Uh, Professor Poe has written uh, several books, but his most important work uh, was done actually on uh, Kwame Nkrumah and his uh, view of Kwame Nkrumah's importance and significance to us is extremely uh, current and, and very real given the enormous problems that we have and have had uh, on the continent of Africa. And uh, this session today, however, uh, is a introduction to a lot of you on many of the issues that are confronting uh, our continent, particularly uh, the two great countries of Nigeria and Ghana. And uh, I want to just make a few comments before uh, I introduce our speakers, uh, who I'm very, very proud of uh, and of, the, of their work and of their thinking and their thoughts. Uh, let me start by saying that I was very disturbed uh, the other day uh, when I heard that there was an attempt afoot for Africans to, uh, particularly African kings, to apologize for the enslavement of African people in the Americas. Uh, that, that disturbed me greatly. Um, and I'll tell you why I'm disturbed, and I've seen it online and many discussions going on on social media about it. Uh, it. It disturbed me because what it does is to try to take guilt away from the Europeans and place it on Africans. And I think that we need to have, uh, particularly now, an Afrocentric view of the whole process of the enslavement. And that's why I don't even call it, uh, you, know, you know, Europeans call it the slave trade. Well, it was not a trade. It was a monstrous kidnapping of African people to force African people to work for free in the Americas. And this was uh, the whole process. When you start back and you look at uh, the very beginning of it, uh, as, as early as the uh, Portuguese in 1444, who went uh, along the west coast of Africa 
and uh, near the Senegal River and kidnapped, actually kidnapped Africans to take them to Lisbon. And this is, eight, this is 1444. Take them to Lisbon uh, as uh, gifts to the king. That this was uh, the beginning of this process of kidnapping. And now uh, we know, and I'm not going to give a whole history of uh, the, what is called the European slave trade, but I, I'll just say this, that uh, ultimately there were Africans who collaborated, that's for sure. But I always make the point, there were Africans who collaborated with Europeans everywhere there, were, there is oppression of Africans. There are Africans who collaborated right here in America. There are Africans who are collaborating with the Europeans right now. There are Africans who uh, collaborated with the people in South Africa, with the police, white police in South Africa. There were Africans who collaborated. So all of these things do happen, that is for sure. But the collaborators are not the innovators. They're not the initiators. They're not the creators of the system. And so, yes, if somebody can trace that their ancestors collaborated, you can say, OK, we, we collaborated. And so uh, we, we want to apologize for that. But uh, if you start that process, then what you have to also remember that the main criminals of the activity toward the African people were, were the Europeans. And if you forget that and you want to put it on the African kings and the African queens, you are mistaken because that is not the truth. Now, there's one other thing that I want to say about this because it comes in context of the woman king. You know, uh, one learns very early that all creativity uh, is uh, mental, it, it, at least in terms of when you create fiction, and that you can use history as a background for fiction, but uh, the fact that you use history as a background for fiction doesn't mean that your fiction is really historical, you know? So uh, I, I enjoyed the Woman King film. Uh, I, I appreciated uh, the beauty and the strength of the, of the black woman. But there are a couple of issues that I have, and I think I should point them out. They're not the normal issues that people have, but, but, but we can talk about that at another point. But, but here's my issue. My issue is that we have in our history the greatest queens in the history of the world. And we can start, if we want to, with Sir Brekna Fru, the first woman in the world who ruled a nation. We, we, we can go and take Hatshepsut, the incredible diplomat who, uh, who initiated, along with uh, her contingent in Kemet, a relationship between Somalia and Kemet. Uh, it was called Punt at that time. This is, this is, these are historical realities. The historical reality of Amana Reeses, Amana Reeses and uh, of Amana Shaketi, the leaders in Nubia who fought the Romans to a standstill. We, we, can, talk, we, can, we can talk about them. That, that's important. These are historical women. Morimi, the great queen of the Yoruba. We can talk about that. We can talk about Nehanda of the Shona, who, defe who, who actually defended her people against the so-called hut tax in Zimbabwe when the uh, British had set up Rhodesia. We can talk about her courage and her bravery and her skill, her military skill. We, we, I mean, there's so many stories of African women leaders that we can talk about. But to take this issue of the woman king and put it in the context of slavery is really, um, what should I say? It, it's, in a, you know, it's one of those things like, wait a minute, were there no other queens? Were there no other women warriors that, you know, this is the, the only, here's why I'm saying this. And 
if you want to write to me or speak to me about this, you can. But let me just say this point. Because I made this in my book, The History of Africa. Um, and, and, and here's what I said. There is no African uh, society where slavery was the principal mode of production. Black people did not enslave people to, to produce things, to get money, and so on. That is, not a, that is not in Africa's history. And the only time it appears in Africa's history is as a result of particularly this situation of the woman king with Dahomey, it appears because of the Portuguese. It's not an African issue. It becomes an African problem. And so to situate the woman king in the midst of Dahomey, which was an aberration in Africa, it was not a normal society in Africa. And it was not a normal society for about 100 or 110 years. But it was, not, it was that way because of D'Souza, the Portuguese who led the slave trade, as they called it between Dahomey and Brazil. That, that's the problem there. So yes, I glory in the, Ago, in the Goja because they were they're great, great, great warriors, great soldiers, you see. But I also understand that this notion of situating it in the midst of the worst Eurocentric uh, atrocities toward African people is problematic for me when we have many other glorious women who have done so many other things. So perhaps now we will have movies on Yaninga, the woman who built her own nation uh, when she rode from a on a horseback from northern Ghana to what is now Burkina Faso and set up the Wadrego uh, uh, clan. I mean, we may, we may one day have that, you see? But for us to just concentrate on Dahomey and make Dahomey the example of the woman king, that's not right. And that's not correct. So I know that African writers and African movie makers will make a difference on that. And I look forward to the time when we do make those differences because, of course, the creativity of our people cannot be questioned. And there are many, many people, many African people who are skilled and ready uh, to do this work. Here's the story. Uh, today at the Malefic Kati Asante Institute in Philadelphia, we have two uh, presenters. And each one is going to talk for 30 minutes, then we're going to have time for questions. Uh, we do have in the chat uh, for our uh, YouTube viewers, we have in the chat uh, a place where you can ask questions. And we will be able to take some of the questions, I'm sure, we will not be able to take all of them, but we are just delighted that you are here with us uh, to hear uh, from uh, Foster Asari, uh, who is from Ghana, and he had his Bachelor's of Education from the University of Education in Winneba. And Winneba, as you know, uh, was one of those historic cities. It was one of the great places in Ghana that uh, Nkrumah had also set up a school for African leaders. It was really a powerful place. And uh, he uh, also um, uh, studied African literature and African languages and education. He has a master's uh, in, uh, uh, actually, uh, from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And I was just uh, joking with him earlier about how cold it is in Madison. I've, been there a couple of times. It's a cold place, Madison, Wisconsin, but a beautiful, cute little town. So, uh, and they do have a really outstanding African language program. African literature and African language, he studied there uh, in uh, linguistics. Uh, he, he was an outstanding student there, and he's in his second year uh, for the doctorate at Temple University uh, in the Department of Africology. So we're going to have him to speak for about 30 minutes. And our next speaker is from Nigeria. He is Chinedo uh, Agbo, an award-winning author, a poet, a researcher, 
educationist and cultural development journalist. And uh, he's inspired to learn uh, uh, from and be taught by all and wishes to create a just, kind, and compassionate world and to be a reason for others' happiness. He's a first-class graduate of Sabella's Maret University, the Suricata and Pontifica Urbaniana University, where he read philosophy, public administration, and journalism. He's a, currently a student at Temple University in the Department of Africology, and as an educator and volunteer teacher, he has taught English, Igbo, literature, and social studies at various institutions, uh, including Comprehensive Secondary School, Ohibe Oba, Sabellus Maret University, Saracata, Kernia, Orphanage, and Regina Passes College, Garki. Uh, and I think this is mainly in, in Indonesia. Uh, Agbo has also been a school administrator, educational consultant, and principal of Comprehensive Secondary uh, School. Uh, he served as a translator and language consultant, uh, and he's also worked for projects on U in the UN and Declaration of Human Rights. So, so you see, we got outstanding speakers and people who are educators. I mean, um, they, they know uh, African culture, and they know what's going on today in, uh, in the continent. So at this time, I'm very happy to be able to introduce uh, Foster Asari comes with that great name that comes from uh, Osa, and it is related to the ancient Kemetic word Osa, and I've always thought that it's a very powerful name. So, Brother Osa, Osari, please come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Marufi Kitasante, and I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk to you about the present um, situation in Ghana. And I'm going to talk about the minutes of Glamse. Glamse is an illegal mining of Ghana. And when people look at it, they just look at how the, the land is being destroyed and everything, and they don't look at what happens or the repercussions on spirituality of the people in Ghana. And I also talk about some suggested solutions because there is a big problem. And I remember last week the president went to Kumasi and he told the people, his M MCE's uh, district um, uh, directors and ministers and the chiefs, kings and the people, and he said, I try to fight this glamse, but I am on a crossroad. I don't know what to do, advise me. And so I think um, I made some suggestions that maybe to may go a long way in helping curb the problem of Galamse in Ghana. I want to talk about this. I wrote a small poem, but I wish I can enlarge it. That there is distraction in Ghana. The distraction is not. There is a distraction in Ghana. Distraction is not your normal distraction. This distraction is not distraction where country destroy another country. The distraction is not a distraction where can destroy another can. The distraction. It's no distraction where one ethnic group destroys another ethnic group. This is not distraction where one race destroys another race. That this distraction is distraction where one wages war on himself or herself. This distraction is where one slaps his or her own face. That this distraction is where one throws punches at himself or herself. This distraction is one that one shoots his or her own leg. This distraction is when destroy, one destroys his, his or her own economy. This is a distraction where one destroys himself or herself. This is a distraction where one destroys his or her own future. 
this is a distraction where one calls for sickness for himself or herself. This is a distraction where one poisons his or her own lamp. This is a distraction where one poisons his or her own waters. When we trace the history of Ghana, one will know that it has had a change of name. After the Europeans meeting in Berlin in 1884 and 85, Africa was slashed into pieces and Ghana became one of the shares of Britain. The British, after finding a lot of gold at a place named the artificial boundary Gold Coast, it was after the gaining of political independence in 1957 under Osage Kwame Nkrumah that the country had a change of name from Gold Coast to Ghana, which means Lion King. Galamse is a quaint word from the pigeon, gala and sell, which is in English is gather and sell, which is illegal mining in Ghana. So galamse is you go and then you gather the gold and then you sell. So they say galamse. Illegal mining is defined locally as a mining operation in which miners without licenses and concessions operate uncontrollably. This illegal mining is perpetrated by the people of Ghana themselves, especially the youth, and people from other African countries who are also involved in the illegal mining in Ghana. But it might interest everyone here that the kingpins of illegal mining in Ghana are the Chinese. I tried to look at the causes of illegal mining in Ghana. And it's because of population growth, income growth, increasing demand for good, economic factors for the country, and then especially unemployment, and then materialism. The effects of illegal mining in Ghana. We have the economic effects which are loss of mineral revenue through smuggling and the importation of food, deforestation, loss of biodiversity, plants, animals, aquatic life, and human life. And I know in no time Ghana will be depopulated. Health, under it we have the injuries, hearing issues, cancer, lung diseases, and other fatalities, because a lot of them are killed in the mines. We have pollution of air, pollution of water, and then pollution of soil. And then, of course, erosion. And then, our big issue, the global warming. I am going to look at the spiritual repercussions on Ghana. From the beginning, at the beginning, in the beginning, Africa has been spiritual. Our spirituality helped us build the pyramids in Kemet and Nubia, and then other civilizations. Spirituality of Africans is what makes us unique. Spirituality was, is, and will always be in the fiber of Africans. The spirits abode in rivers, lakes, mountains, trees, just to mention a few. And so when you go to Africa, when you go to Ghana, everywhere the spirits can be there and one can go there and console them. I ask one natural resource be, oh, I ask, can natural resource be a curse on our environment and spirituality? The answer is no. Gold in some parts of Ghana cannot be a curse. We are Africans and should live in harmony with nature and the cosmic. Ghanaians have destroyed the habitats of 
their spiritual forces and their ancestors, the gods and the goddesses, are abandoning the country, if not abandoned the country already. When one is sick, he or she could go to the river banks under the trees with sacrifice to the gods or the goddesses, and they get healed. When there is calamity in the community, they fall on their gods and the goddesses for help. Now they have been driven away by our human activities. We have severed the relationship with the spirits, and things are falling apart. How can we get children when our women become barren? Because when women are barren, they go to the rivers, and they make sacrifices, and they get children. And that is our belief. How can we get bounty harvest from fishing and crop farming? Because before starting farming or before going to the sea, they pour libation to the ancestors, they pour libation to the rivers, to the sea, to the gods and the goddesses for bumper harvest. And now we have driven them away. How are we going to be blessed whilst we have casted the blazer away? Whom do we run to when there is outbreak of diseases or disaster? Our spirituality was before science. And our spirituality, as I said, was before science. Before science came, we had our spirituality. And it helped us do so many things. It helped us win wars when people were sick. It is our spirituality. That helps us heal them. Dancing, singing, and they become possessed and they get healed. People who need children go to the shrines and they are given dolls to carry at the backs and they are able to conceive. People are sick and they go and draw water from the rivers. They talk to the rivers. The river goddess or the river god, and they become healed. Now the waters are muddy. Now the waters are contaminated with mercury and other toxic substances. So you cannot even go to drink because the moment you take it, <laughs> you are poisoning yourself. Some time ago, when people were sick and needed something, they just go and wash themselves in the rivers. Now the rivers are muddy. So you get yourself more dirty than getting into the river. So these are the things, the repercussions of Galamse on the spirituality of Ghana. I come to some suggestions for solutions. And now, number one, I talk of education to make the people of Ghana conscious of the effects of Galamse on Ghana now and the near future. This consciousness should be through the in inclusion of Galamse in the syllabi from basic schools to the university. National consciousness on the effect of Galamse on the mass media, both print and electronic the radio, televisions, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and the newspapers. I think they all have work to do because this is a war, a fight that everybody should be included in. The government alone cannot do it. The ministers cannot do it. The chiefs, because the whole thing is they themselves are also involved. So we have to be conscious what we are doing, and we need education. And they themselves, they have to be educated, both in government and those not in government. Because it's the same people who do all this, and then they help get the money and then support their parties. It is true, the Galamse. And I also talk of, there should be public forums to be organized in the affected areas to make the people aware of the menace of Galamse. 
Movie producers must produce movies on the devastation effects of galante on the country. Musicians, comedians must create music and comedy, comedy on the menace of galante. Galante courts must be established in all the constituencies that galante is ongoing with jurors taken from the communities to adjudicate in the galante courts with severe punishment given to the perpetrators. Three, there should be formation of watchdogs from the communities and the military and police task force to the affected communities, but with renewal minds. I said this because some time ago, when the current government came to power, he set up this task force, military and police. And when they got there to the Glamse sites, they became corrupted. And instead of fighting the Galamse, they rather started extorting monies from them and then giving them go ahead to do their work. The cars and other things that they had, to, logistics that they had to use, they were found in their girlfriend's places because <laughs> they didn't go to do the work. So they have to have a renewal of mind the police and the soldiers, because they are to protect the country and the police are to enforce the laws in the country. And if the law enforcers are them themselves are not enforcing the laws and they are breaking the laws, then they have to renew their own mind. And I also said, sponsors of the galaxy, both home and abroad must come together to form mining companies for the youth to get jobs to do. These um, excavators and other things, the ordinary Ghanaian cannot afford them. It is those people outside the country, those rich men, women in the country, that buys these excavators and then give it to the people to destroy the land. So I am suggesting Instead of them destroying the land, why don't they come together, form mining companies, where the youth will be able to get jobs? Because one of the main problems of this galamse is unemployment for the youth. People graduate, they don't get job. Those who don't go to school, they don't have jobs. And if they think that if there is money on the land, are they to stop? No. And they will use their own means to get money, to feed themselves, and to survive. And I also said that external miners must be offered a channel to formally register with governmental agencies and must be encouraged to form local mining cooperatives. The cooperatives will serve as a conduit to provide small-scale miners with necessary skills, training, including but not limited to education, or the impact of irresponsible mining on health, safety, environment, and the economy. Six, the government must tighten regulatory controls on mine closures. And seven, the government must create alternative employment opportunities for the youth. And the last one I suggest, there should be land reclamation and then planting of trees. In my conclusion, I say the fight against Galamse should be a collective effort devoid of partisan politics. The war against Galamse must be all inclusive, not sitting on the fence. But all citizens and non-citizens take actions and reactions against this devil that has come to stay with us. Sickness, death, food shortages, which are direct results of galamse activities, are not respecters of young or old, rich or poor, master or servant, pastor or congregant, professors or students, military or civilians, president or the electorate. Your life. My life, our lives, 
are at stake, so Ghanaians must be patriotic. Selfless and eschew greed, individualistic, materialistic, and embrace unity and oneness as we fight this canker, which we can see, and at the same time, we cannot see for the progress of the country. Posterity will one day judge us for our actions, reactions or inactions. We are all involved. We are either part of the problem or part of the solution. I urge us all to be part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Foster Asari. We will um, uh, have questions after the next speaker. The, the, the next uh, presenter uh, is going to be uh, Brother uh, Chinedu uh, Agbo. Uh, we certainly have learned a lot uh, re regarding Galamsi. And uh, it's a new word for me, uh, but the concept of gathering and selling uh, I got it, and it's a very powerful concept uh, that we need to explore, and we'll explore your solutions, and I'm sure that we will have some people who will uh, be asking questions, both from here as well as from uh, YouTube. At this time, uh, we're going to ask uh, Brother Agbo to come forward. Um, I think it's a privilege standing before all of you, uh, standing before my teachers, my professors, and then the rest of you here. Uh, I'll start by recalling a statement made by Professor Asante when he was introducing us. He said that uh, the people who are going to speak today are coming from two great countries in Africa, uh, Nigeria and Ghana. Yes, that statement is, yeah, is true uh, and also not true. Yes, depending on how you look at it. That statement also reminded me of my experience in Surakarta when I was doing my uh, master's program, Surakarta in Indonesia. And um, we were at a, 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 a shop owned by a Chinese and uh, we were like, 10 Africans, I was the only one from Nigeria. So as he introduced, uh, as everybody introduced themselves and I, he asked me and I said, I'm from Nigeria. <laughs> the man said, Nigeria? I said, yes, I'm from Nigeria. He said, repeated, Nigeria? I said, yes, I'm from Nigeria. <laughs> and then he said, hmm, Nigeria, very rich, very, very rich. I said, in my mind, I said, yes, very rich. But are Nigerians actually rich? Nigeria is rich, but Nigerians are not rich. That's the irony. And then the man went on to talk to the rest of my African brothers. He told them, Nigeria can buy each one of your country, one by each, one by each. That is that Nigeria is capable of buying all the other countries all the other guys from we, uh, uh, that I came with to, the, to his shop. Okay. He looked at me. I wasn't amused by what he was saying. And then he tapped me on the, sh on the shoulders and said, young man, I, I know the problem. Your leaders. Your leaders. So that leads me to what I'm going to talk about today. And that is um, about Nigeria. I'm going to talk about Nigeria. Um, and my team, my talk. You the wrong, get get a coffee drink with a drop cup. Good. <laughs> so, um, good. So, this very uh, sound you heard, and there was a time it went, it was so viral. Uh, the the 
the theme of the song is uh, we want bam bam. We want bam bam. Uh, bam bam actually is bamba is actually a pidgin lingo in Nigeria, pidgin English. Uh, what some of uh, some people call Creole, but our own uh, English, Nigerian English, and it's like saying you want to blend in maybe in non formal English. You want to blend. You want to belong. So it was a, a remix of um, a song uh, called Dorime, and done, was done by Goya Meno, a Nigerian uh, artist, and the. He was trying to pass a message across that, uh, that warning young people not to join uh, fraternities that will ruin their life in future. Uh, so many people dance to this music not actually knowing what it means. And uh, that meaning is very important because it has also implications even among some Nigerians. Why does this same music uh, made waves, including uh, uh, that it co it caught, uh, some people caught the bug even here in the US. I remember seeing uh, this man, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Shaq, Shaq O'Neill, dancing to this. So, good. So, yeah. So, Dorime caught that bug worldwide. That, I mean, so many people were just vibing to it. But of course, most people didn't know the lyrics and what it actually meant. While that music was, uh, uh, w went viral, uh, some Nigerians also didn't like that music. <laughs> Unfortunately, it might be surprising because of also misunderstanding uh, that cuts across. Now, the music says uh, um, you want to bamba, you want to chill with the big boys. That's the, the lyrics, the chorus. That is, you want to belong. You want to do what the big boys do to belong. Because it is uh, assumed that big, for you to be a big boy, you have to join a cult or something like that. And then, as a third person, the musician was like a parent uh, advising his child, his son, please don't join a cult to become a big boy. Some Nigerians, as I said, did, who didn't also understand the message, uh, I remember a friend uh, who told me that he can't allow his children to listen to that kind of song. And he was so vehement about it. I asked him why. He said that's a very bad song that it leads the children away from uh, morals and all that. All my efforts trying to explain to him that no, he was actually wrong that it is the opposite. He didn't take that. Now, that leads us to um, what I said I'm talking about, which is, uh, uh, sorry, can you get the, the okay. Okay, so that leads us to what I'm talking about this evening. The West and the tragedy of Nigeria's non-homogeneity, how the former exploits the latter for its own benefit. So, uh, by reference, uh, Nigeria as a non-homogeneous state. By reference uh, to non-homogeneity, it simply means that Nigeria is not truly uh, a nation state. Homogeneity entails that there is a uniform cultural heritage, language, ethnicity, and people. Non-homogeneity implies no uniform cultural heritage, language, ethnicity, people, or origin regarding the composition of a state or a society. Prior to the colonial era, different political communities in Nigeria had their system of governance, which was well suited to their tradition and cultural heritage. Societies had their own way and manner of compelling their subjects to follow certain responses or actions at any given time and a system of governance which may be termed politics varied from one location to another. Prior to amalgamation of Northern and Southern Nigeria in 1914, and right before the first colonial ship landed in the Southern Ajo and the subsequent ones at Lagos Island, the area now 
that is the area we regard today as Nigeria. Uh, I have to emphasize this because some, I personally, I believe there are no Nigerians. What we have are just different ethnic nationalities uh, created in a space by, uh, put in a space and called Nigerians by the white man. So that's why I'm emphasizing this. The area now uh, known as Nigeria comprises people with diverse social backgrounds, religious beliefs, culture, traditions, and practices. The level of commonality and communality amongst the people now known and referred to as Nigerians were highly restricted to little geographical uh, areas. Vast areas have nothing in common and are not communal. So uh, what I'm trying to explain here is that, uh, just as I mentioned earlier, that Nigeria as it is, is actually a, a, a space created for white man's interest. And uh, because the people residing in that space have what you might call nothing in common, except that they are all black people. That is the only thing that unites them. When we, we look at this from the angle of culture, uh, we say that culture is people's way of life. And if you look at the cultural leanings of these different peoples that people, the space called Nigeria, you see that the, the, com the commonality is not there. The commonality in their culture is not there. And that has been uh, a, a very telling issue among the people. Uh, the pre-colonial, look at the pre-colonial Nigerian societies. Nigeria has over 200 ethnic groups, including Ijo, Nupe, Kanuri, Ishekiri, Urobo, uh, Ikwere, Anam, Kalabari, um, uh, Ibibio, Efik, among others, with the three major uh, ones. We have three major ethnic groups in Nigeria, uh, Hausa, Ibo, and Yoruba. Uh, personally, I actually sympathize with those the people regard, historians regard as minor ethnic groups. Personally, I don't believe there is actually any minor ethnic group in Nigeria. Yes, because if you, uh, if I've seen uh, some people, for instance, there's hardly any, any space in Nigeria that you don't find a job people. Yet, the historians regard them as minor ethnic group. So what actually makes them minor? How some people that also people see as being one of the major ethnic groups? I have done some surveys, and I don't think that is true. But the language dominates. The language is one of the dominant languages in Nigeria. In short, elsewhere, you see people speaking Hausa language. So as I, that's why I say that I really don't believe there are, are any minor ethnic groups. It's just that historians have carried that narrative till today. And so I'm going to address the ones people have chosen as the uh, three major ethnic groups in Nigeria. So which are um, Aousa, Igbo, and uh, Yoruba. So the Federal Republic of Nigeria, as we know today, uh, where these tribes are located, is a country located in West Africa and on the Gulf of Guinea. The country came into existence following the fusion or amalgamation of diverse groups in 1914, as I've mentioned earlier. In October, uh, it, uh, it became an independent nation at October in 1960. So Nigeria is 62 years uh, this year. Good. So uh, I, I also, this is also very important because uh, one of the things that uh, Dr. Sante mentioned was that we are going to talk about contemporary issues in Nigeria. I personally believe that Nigeria is actually a contemporary location because we are just 62 years from independence. So if you add how many years uh, from amalgamation, we're talking about 100 or something years that Nigeria had existed. Before then, the, uh, the people m that make up this uh, space called Nigeria have been living their lives. So. Nigeria has about 250 ethnic groups, as I mentioned earlier, and a rapidly growing population of over 180 million people. This implies that the country is not a homogeneous state, 
The fusion of these varied groups with languages, customs, beliefs, and cultural differences present its difficulties, which from 1960 to the present has continued to throw up newer challenges with persistent and violent conflicts threatening its existence. The West had seen themselves, Eurocentrically speaking, as being superior, better, more rational, more logical, and therefore empowered to determine how others would live their own lives and make use of their own resources, sadly. Africans have not chosen to remain in the lowest cadre and abide by the hierarchical structure designed by the West based on their myopic Eurocentric perspectives. Thus, the outstanding strides and stance made by various Afrocentric scholars and Afro Africologists, uh, like our distinguished Professor Asante, have insisted on the relevance of African experiences, culture, heritage, value, and people. Based on the foregoing, my lecture, which I'm talking about today, on the non-homogeneous states of Nigeria states that the, uh, the society today we are talking about, which is uh, Nigeria, had its own e uh, style of economy, its own style of politics, its own style of uh, uh, living, of community living, and so on and so, so forth. Some areas were rooted in their customs where the monarchical head is seen as first and above all others. And all decisions emanate from him. In other places, the monarchical head can only act in concerted efforts with their cabinets or council members. Otherwise, such actions will be futile. In some parts of Nigeria, there were no monarchical rulers. The power resides with the people who, by virtue of rights, are represented in the village council by their family heads. In other parts of Nigeria also, where Islamic religion had rested its foot, those areas practiced what could be termed a theocracy, as religious heads were also the political heads. Prior to the amalgamation of northern and southern Nigeria in 1914, and right before the first colonial ship landed in the southern Ejo, as I mentioned earlier, the area we now call Nigeria, with various beliefs and culture, had a, 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 a commonality among its very own people, and of course, a commonality also. That is, the Igbo people, for instance, had a commonality of culture. The Aosa people had a commonality of culture. The Jopo had a commonality of culture among themselves. So, the colonial regime brought different forms of cultures, beliefs, and styles of living, culminating in our country's political system today. The Hiteto independent societies were amalgamated into a single entity we call Nigeria. While the colonial regime lasted, there were a series of introductions and changes made in various aspects of the country, especially politically. On this note, it is proper to state that political governance as practiced today in Nigeria was partly copied uh, uh, and later copied, copied from, uh, from the British and later from the United States of America. Colonialism brought into place the being of the Nigerian state. It follows that there was no existing geographical territory known and refers to as Nigeria until the inception of colonialism in the area we call Nigeria today. On the, uh, the Nigerian society, pre-colonial Nigerian societies, where, which I've already spoken about, the, 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 the so-called minor and major ethnic groups, the Aosa people designated in Nigeria occupied the northern part of the country presently. It is observed that the Aosa live in small villages and other forms of cities with a predominant interest in crop plantation and livestock farming. In terms of political structure, the Aosa Fulani facilitated a centralized system of governance also known as chiefdom society. And a similar style of governance was also the political structure of a pre-colonial Yoruba society. However, the latter is more decentralized when compared with the former. But the same is not the case in Igbo pre-colonial society, which practiced a wholly decentralized system of governance. I will emphasize on the connotation Hausa Fulani, because some people uh, miss out on that. Originally, the Hausa people were considered as historically distinct from the Fulani people. Arguably, 
the Hausa people were originally settled at the present day northern Nigeria as pagans, while the Fulani people were Islam uh, adherents who had migrated to the present day northern Nigeria and integrated with the indigenous people of, uh, of Hausa community. It was the Fulani Jihad of uh, 1804 and 1810, led by Shehu Usman Danfodio and its successful prosecution against the already established uh, Hausa dynasty in the present day northern Nigeria that brought about the present descriptor of Hausa Fulani as one people. So when you see it in history books, this is the history behind that. The migration of Fulani and their cultural integration that spanned for a long number of years bettered the people of Hausa and Fulani as one people. Notably, the jihadist movement between 1804 and 1810, led by uh, Danfodio, greatly impacted the pre colonial Hausa Fulani community. Usman Danfodio merged the present day Hausa Fulani states. He categorized them into two distinct caliphates administratively operating from Sokoto and Gwandu for the Eastern and Western Caliphates, respectively, imposing himself as the Sarikin Muslim, that is, the head of the, of the Muslim region, of the entire region. Muslim is like uh, a mass of a people, sort of, the faithful. In order to conduct administrative duties with ease and limited resources, the two caliphates were further divided into different emirates headed by emirs, meant to be responsible and accountable to the caliphates. The emir was to be assisted by some other officers of the emirates, such as Waziri, who acted as the prime minister, Madawaki, who was in charge of the military, Maji, who was in charge of finance and other treasury resources, among others. Accordingly, each emirate is also divided into districts headed by officers known and referred to as Hakimi, Sorry, I'm giving this lay down history because it leads us exactly into what I'm talking about, how the West is exploiting these differences among the various tribes. The officers aid the emirs in the governance and administration of the emirates as they were to be consulted by the emir in terms of any affairs or issues concerning the emirates. However, the power is limited to those of delegates as they play an advisory role majorly. Though a similarity exists in Yoruba pre-colonial society, the difference is that the emir can remove any of the officials without the officials having the power to remove the emir. The members of his council can remove the Yoruba king. Sharia law was the known law guiding the Hausa Fulani area. The Sharia law made provisions for matters relating to marriage, divorce, murder, deaths, among others. The Sharia law is administered in the Akali courts headed by the Akali judges. Aside from the judicial administration headed by the Akali, the emir is in charge of both executive and legislative powers and functions. The Yoruba. The Yoruba people had an already made unitary system of government prior to the colonial era. A typical kingdom in Yoruba land had headquarters and other smaller towns and villages. Furthermore, the political structure is made of central authority and then subordinate authorities. In most cases, the central authority is occupied by the king, the Oba, who was usually assisted by a collection of traditional titled chiefs who aid in the administration of the kingdom. The subordinate authorities are headed by uh, the Baales, who represent the Oba in their respective villages or towns. And in the same way in which the Oba operates with chiefs, the Baales also operate with chiefs in their respective towns and villages. And in order to ensure the flow of authority through the rightful channel, the balance we are paying homage in the uh, form of annual entitlement called a sakole. That is something like tithe in our Christian denominations to the oba. Where any balance fails to pay such homage, it may result in the removal and, subs and subsequent punishment of such uh, balance. Unlike the Fulani, the Hausa Fulani pre-colonial society, checks and balances was a major tool in the pre-colonial society of the Yoruba communities. Thus, it is possible for the subordinates to challenge or invalidate actions or decisions taken by the central authority insofar as it can be shown that such was apparently wrong. For instance, the process of impeachment or vote of no confidence 
can be imposed on the sitting king in the Oyo kingdom. Uh, called the, Oyo, the Oyo king is called Alafi, Alafi of Oyo. Uh, in the Oyo empire, there are actions of the Alafi, that's the king, which are considered impeachable actions. And upon the commission of such action, the kingmakers, headed by the Bashoru, will represent an empty calabash, that is the practice, to the king, signifying his impeachment or rejection. And the king, upon receiving such, is mandated to compulsorily vacate the royal stool and commit suicide. In the Yoruba pre-colonial society, the judicial administrative powers were vested in the Oboni court. A group of persons, the Oboni court is a group of persons empowered to ensure there is the maintenance of law and order, preservation of cultural and societal values and the norms, and also with the power, is invested with the power to influence the tide of things. Now, the, the third pre-colonial society, the, one of the so-called major tribes in Nigeria, the Igbo. The traditional pre-colonial uh, pre Igbo society is one that is quasi-democratic in nature with a look-alike republican system of governance that is decentralized when compared to the already discussed ethnic groups. The system guaranteed equality of citizens and the entire community. Generally, the communities were governed by a form of consultative assembly made up of common people, often represented by a council of elders called Ndichie. Uh, some of them wear this cap I'm wearing now, what we are looking at. I'm not an Ichie, but in my own community, anybody can put on this. But generally, uh, in Igbo land, the Ndichie put on this cap I'm, uh, I'm having as a, as, a, as a sign that they are elders or they are, they are chiefs, something like that. The members of the Council of Elders are re respected, respected but never revered as royal kings. It's very important we, we note this, that in, for the Igbo, unlike the Yoruba and the Aousa, the members of the Council of Elders are respected, but they were not revered. Each of them had an assigned role to perform in line with the collective function of the consultative assembly. A typical Igbo community has no king. This is well captured in Igbo aphorism that goes uh, Igbo Enweze, meaning the Igbos, the Igbo people have no king. All the male members of the family are part of the council, known as Omonna, in charge of making rules and regulations in the society. Usually headed by the eldest son of the family, referred to as Diokpa or Diokpara, where there is a need to make a decision that will affect the entire community or punishment of anyone, the entire communal members are gathered at the village square with the principal members of each family ably represented in the gathering. Where a decision has been taken by the assembly or the council, it is the age group, the age grade, what we call Otobo in Igbo, the, or majorly, majorly composed by the, uh, comprised of the youths, that they are meant to enforce the decisions taken. Another form of authority is the Umuada. Umuada are the daughters of a particular clan, a particular village. They are a group of women, ably led by first daughters and empowered to represent the ideal Igbo woman. Umuada helped to ensure that the virtues and values of every Igbo woman were preserved and sustained. From the foregoing, we can see the political structure in the Igbo land did not allow any form of centralized authority. The centralization was of high prevalence with each political institution performing distinct functions aimed at communal uh, growth. The Igbo had no traditional rulers in the form of kings or emirs as the Yoruba and Fulani, as I mentioned earlier. Thus, it cannot be said that the Igbo had a kingdom or empire, as the largest political unit was the communal and city villages. So, it can be said that the political system in the pre-colonial Igbo society was acephalous in nature. In a given village, all the family heads held the offer of what is like an effigy, is, is a symbolic representation of influence and innocence and also justice. You can't hold the of four in Igbo community if you are an unjust person or if you are known to be an evil person, which they represented and of course showed in their actions. So you have, for you to hold of four, you have to be a very special uh, good person. In quote. Uh, finally, 
uh, before I go to other uh, themes I have here before uh, another thing, I want to talk about the British conquest and entrance to present-day Nigeria. As of 1700s, uh, the British Empire, as well as other powers in Europe, has settled across West Africa with no form of plantation colonies as in America and the West Indies. Though Nigeria, like every other African settlement, resisted the European powers and claim, such did not last for long. Slave trade, trading was the major trade or business which European powers engaged in across West Africa. Between 1790 and 1807, the British slave traders conducted slave trade within Lagos and the, the trade was sub subsequently traded under the Portuguese. By 1807, the British government prohibited her subjects from partaking in the slave trade, which was done by enactment of Slave Trade Act. Subsequently, the British were able to lobby the other European powers of France, Portuguese, and Belgium into leaving the territory for the British, uh, for the, uh, British traders. As uh, Mbango argued in 2018 that the British interests to sway against slave trade within her colonies and the territories like Nigeria is not one built primarily on humanitarian justice, but we are mainly to give room for her to propagate her imperial interest. So they are abandoning the slave trading was not because they love, they now began to love us suddenly. No, it was for imperial interest, as we shall see later. The early Portuguese missionaries who usually traveled with the traders to West Africa we are able to introduce Christianity in the old uh, Edo Empire spread into Lagos and Ibadan, leading to the opening of the first Christian church known as Church Mutual Society. Uh, because of time, in 1870, the various companies were amalgamated into a single company known as the United African Company. This company still exists in Nigeria today under various platforms. With time, the company regarded itself as the sole administrator and Leg legitimate government for the entire territory of the Niger. That is, Niger, when we talk of Niger here, we talk, we're talking of the southern and northern uh, protectorates of Nigeria, which uh, I've explained earlier when I talked about the ethnic groups. Through, uh, through conquest, the territory known and referred to as Nigeria uh, became a colonial government of the British Empire and then was being managed by them. And then uh, government, it was a government, but had other socio-economic and socio-cultural uh, socio activities under their custody in Nigeria. That is, they, as they uh, uh, made inroads politically and culturally and economically, they also sustained other interests uh, in Nigeria. Uh, for time's sake, I'm going to rush to what their inroad into Nigeria has cost us. Uh, and also the, the, how the non-homogeneous uh, homogen non nature of Nigeria, what the, one of the effects, and uh, what also makes, us, makes it non-homogeneous again. One of it is religion. I tell a, st a short story here. Um, Nigeria is arguably uh, one of the, I think the only most uniquely religiously structured country in the world. Nigeria is the only country with a uh, number of uh, adherents of Islam and Christianity almost equal. 53% for Islam and 45% for Christians. So there's no other country like that with such a uh, composition of the two Abrahamic religions. And uh, this, uh, this is one of the uh, uh, factors that is contributing to the crisis you sometimes hear about in Nigeria. So I, I was once, uh, a friend was once talking with um, a colleague, and um, a, a, Northern, a, a colleague from Northern Nigeria, as I explained from my previous uh, take about that the Northern Nigeria is Islam, the Southern Nigeria is Christian, majorly Christian. And uh, this colleague, they, as they, uh, they were, he showed some kind of sympathy and support for Boko Haram. I'm sure most of us here are aware of what Boko Haram is. It's just like ISIS, ISIS something like that. Good. So he, he, he showed some support for Boko Haram ideals, but says that he condemns the violence. He's well-to-do and had some 
postgraduate education in the West and is politically relevant to a degree. No thanks to the Arabization of the, uh, of the Northern Nigeria, for someone who has studied a bit of radical Islamic Wahhabism, he knew after a few arguments that he would admire the terror group. He sees the Nigerian society, especially the predominantly Christian South, as morally rotten. Girls, for him, must marry early uh, to shield them from premarital sex. To him, and many like him, moral dictatorship is central to his vision about redeeming society. Seeing as this is apparently un unforeseeable in a democracy, except he can elect sufficient moral uh, fascists to lash society into order, it is unclear how he hopes to realize his dreams without terror. He blames Nigeria's moral turpitude on Western civilization and brainwashing. And here is the catch. He believes, like, like Christianity, just like my friend, Islam is not a native African religion. Thus, any accusation of brainwashing and cultural dominance can only go both ways. But while many Southerners are critiquing Christianity and other Western systems with some reverting to our indigenous African uh, religions, such spiritual decolonization is barely happening in the Muslim North, which is sad. Most Nigerians have heard of Shango, Shango, that's the Yoruba deity. Mm -hmm. Amadioha, the Igbo deity, Obatala, the Yoruba deity also, Abiyama, the Igbo deity, again, Igbo deity, god of the sky, and other indigenous southern cosmological entities. But little has been heard of pre-Islamic Hausa belief systems, for instance. Remember I mentioned earlier when I was talking of the three uh, dominant uh, ethnic groups that the, the, these people, the Hausa people, were pagans before Arabization came. Same for other northern ethnicities, so much that you would think they had no spiritualities of their own before their conquest by Arabian culture. I remember what uh, Dr. Sante mentioned sometime when he said he, travel, he, when he travels to some of our African universities in the African continent, that he doesn't see Africa being represented. You see chapel yes. and then mosque in, in our universities in Africa, mm -hmm. but you don't see shrines yeah. dedicated to these deities, which is sad. Okay. So, so, all this is concerning because there are many like him in the north, and we are all sucked into the attendant bedlam. The Christian absolutist can be enraged by your moral depravity, but is patiently waiting for rapture to decide a phase so that you will burn forever in hell. If that is taking too long for the Christian, he can, in the meantime, wish that you suffer disease and ill luck and pain before you die to face the agony being stirred for you forever since 2,000 years ago. Finally, uh, to bring my presentation to a close, I want to read a poem from uh, uh, my, one of my books. Uh, the, title is, the title of the book is Before I Die. And uh, this, this poem, the title is Prayer of Unborn Nigerian. Remember we are talking about our non-homogeneous nature and how the West exploits this to their own benefit. The poem reads, I'm not yet born, but can see the land that one day will be mine, the streams from which I will one day sip, and the citizenship that will soon be my millstone. I can hear directly the dissonance of dialects I will one day speak, and the divisions that will be mine to inherit. Even now, I can sense my future fellow citizens shuffling and hustling to mosques and churches with a fervor that burns hot and runs deep. Their faces etched intensely by godless favor, but hearts sweated by the shallow shrouds of deceit. I'm still in my womb but can smell the putrefaction that pervades public life and the perfidy that prevails in private practice. I can see a ruler totally disconnected from the pervasive reality of poverty, unable to grasp the enormity of obligations of their office, and incapable of nurturing hope in the millions of hearts whose burden I will soon share. 
And so, while others are born into beauty and bounty, I know before I'm born that my yoke will be one of bone-crushing poverty and insecurity, of lies, fears, and tears, one of colossal deaths and heart-wrenching despair. I'm still to stay at the sunlight that shines on our savannah, but its shadows have shown my soul the similitude of the shack where I will be born, the untrained hands that will be the first to seize me, and the bush lamps that will shine my steps. Without being told, I know that my solitary serenity will only return when I come back in turn in the wombs of Mother Earth. My eyes are still closed, my breathing shallow, but I sense the sitting hatred that shares the soil on which I will soon stand. I see a land where Muslims regard Christians with suspicion and disdain, and where the latter regard the former with scorn. I see a land where the South feels it has been treated shabbily by rulers from the North, and therefore sees nothing wrong with being treated even worse by any character, regardless of how profligate, pernicious, and pedantic. What I can see, but my living compatriots refuse to see and recognize, is that Muslim or Christian, North or South, the elite eat together in private with their Western counterparts and carve up our heritage while the common man is fed doses of hatred, bigotry, and false hope. And so, they wallow in poverty and regard the theft of their birthrights as the culmination of divine destiny. I'm not yet born, but already repulsed by the schools that I will one day attend. I can feel the cold bay floors, shattered window panes, the peeling paints and crumbling masonry. I shudder at the cold stairs my teachers will soon direct at me to spring from some deep-seated hatred of a trade they despise but cannot depart. And because our leaders steal money meant for public schools to educate their children abroad in select schools, I discern that I will go to school and unlettered ignorant and come out a certified ignoramus. No school will admit me for further studies. No employer will give me a job, and no one simply has my time, and yet are born. But detect that I cannot change the scam they call freedom. I cannot exercise the liberty of choice because my democracy is a sham. I can't confide in my imams, nor confess to my priests and pastors, for they are part of the shame. And I cannot share these fears with friends as we are not from the same zone, nor speak the same tone. I cannot be myself because I have no right to be. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. We have one question from the chat from Joyce King, Dr. Joyce King. Um, Chinedu, actually, if you can come back up, she has a question for you, Chinedu. Uh, yeah. She says, uh, could Chinedu comment on the relevance of Jope's understanding of the cultural unity of Africa for his understanding of the area we call Nigeria? And Chinedu, that's for you. Yes, uh, Dr. Joyce King, can you, can you uh, Chinedu, Chinedu, you wanna come in? Try that. If he cannot, Joyce, I'll, I'll answer it for you. Okay. You can I think uh, I better, since my prof has uh, already uh, guaranteed me protection. Okay. Um, I'll try my best, and then Professor Asante will do the, the justice to it. Uh, uh, but your question regarding um, uh, Diop's, uh, Diop's uh, uh, concept Community of. Africa. How the uh, idea fits into the cultural unity of Africa? Uh, into this into Ebola Nigeria. Ebola Nigeria. Ebola. Okay, okay, good. Yes, um, um, taking the Diop's stand uh, that um, uh, our, our cultural uh, sameness, our culture, what I'm, I call cultural sameness uh, among Nigerians those we call Nigerians, the ethnic uh, groups that make up Nigeria, the cultural sameness actually tie to what Diop talked about. Uh, that's my understanding mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. it. So even though, yes, true, there are differences. Mm -hmm. The differences are there, as I mentioned in my presentation. But yet, we have that sameness of culture mm -hmm. that is, uh, is common everywhere you go in Africa and it's very evident. 
So I, I think uh, Professor Asante can talk more, talk more about that. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let's give uh, Chenet another applause. Yeah, and, and really, uh, both of these uh, young men, they have just given us such a wonderful um, presentation, and really, I, I've, they've expanded our understanding. Um, I, I'm just really proud and, and just really honored to uh, be in, in their presence and giving these talks. Uh, f let me just say this to Dr. King. Uh, Dr. King is, of course, uh, one of the great uh, eminent uh, scholars in our field and uh, is uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, very knowledgeable of, of these subjects, that uh, the question of culture has to enter the picture for us to have a real understanding of this. And I think that is what Chenato was just saying. Uh, but I, I want to look at it this way, that the... Uh, similarities between Yoruba and uh, Igbo are greater than the similarities between those two and Hausa. And that is largely because of the religious influence of Islam on the north, you see. So uh, if we take, for example, the idea, uh, not just of uh, uh, Job's idea of cultural unity. Job was talking about cultural unity in a sense that uh, even though he was born in an Islamic family, he recognized that there were commonalities between the majority of African people, that there were similarities, that their names may be different. You give different uh, names to different values, but they were same. This is, as I always say, the, the question of character, the, the Yoruba culture uh, uh, character, uh, uh, idea of Iwa, uh, meaning character, Iwa Pele, good character. Good character is carried out throughout all of the African ethnic groups in, a, in basically the same way. Reverence for ancestors is definitely there. Uh, the love of children and the significance of children and families, th these things are still there. Um, how people relate to um, uh, uh, food production Similarly, uh, concepts of governance, the, the, Euro, the Igbo uh, system, and I don't call them tribes because a tribe is a, you know, Europeans see that as a negative name. They don't call any Europeans tribes. They can say the French nation or the, you know, the Irish people. So, but the Igbo people, for example, uh, are, uh, are unique in the sense of the uh, sort of equality that exists among the people. So they don't have the hierarchical situation in the same way that you would find uh, in Yoruba or even, of course, with the uh, uh, tradition uh, in the North that was uh, put into place largely by Dan Fadio. So it's a, very, it's a very complicated issue, but I think a significant issue is that the, you, you have, um, you have uh, jokes notion of the cultural unity, a meaning at the very base of African culture, what is at the heart of African culture, the core of African culture, would give us a possibility of talking about unity. And I just wanted to add one other thing, and that is that uh, this is why it's going to be important uh, to hear from uh, Dr. Poe on the 23rd of October, because the whole question of uh, the unity of Africa, the United States of Africa, Pan-Africanism, all of that is related to the same issue. And if, if you cannot have uh, a Nigeria, which obviously is problematic, and I'm saying it's problematic because I talk to a lot of Nigerians, it's problematic as a country, and it's a force. It, it is, in, in fact, an artificial uh, uh, country. I mean, that's why you still have many issues, not just internal to Nigeria, but with the borders of Nigeria. Cameroon has an issue. They say the people in Cameroon and the Igbo people are the same people. So that's, that's an issue. But all these issues are created by the European division of the continent. These are not, uh, these are not natural divisions. So if you have a United States of Africa, what do you have to do? Well, what do you have to do is you have a federation where you also then give power 
and give voice to each of the ethnic communities on the continent. This is something that has, it, it has to happen. You can't do it any other way. You have got to respect all of the people. And if you don't respect all of the people, you will never have, you will never be able to put together the kind of nation that we need to have in terms of Africa as a continental unity that we talk about when we talk about Pan-Africanism. Now, the way that the, the Yoruba, the uh, Fulani Hausa, and, uh, Euro, uh, and uh, Igbo, and uh, Ijo, and uh, Ibibio, and uh, Efik, uh, and uh, many of the other people in Nigeria can be together probably is a federation. And a federation will give everybody equal kinds of uh, power and influence. But you can't have one group dominating another group. That's, that wouldn't work, that, that wouldn't work uh, for long. It may work for a while, but it wouldn't work for long. So part of what we have to do is to consider how, when we create uh, a, a United States of Africa, we have a foundation where we have an understanding that uh, these various nations or ethnic groups of Africans, some of these ethnic groups are larger than uh, countries in, uh, in Europe. They have more people. I mean, they're larger. Uh, the Igbo, Yoruba, and the Hausa nations are larger than most of the countries in Europe. Uh, I mean, they have more people than Finland and Sweden and Italy and so on. So you can't, um, uh, when you, so when you look at it, you have to figure out how do you hold these politics together. You can hold them together internally in terms of them, themselves, but you also need to try to figure out how you have a confederation. And I think you can only do that when you have the uh, uh, same principles. You've got to be on the same common cultural ground. Uh, I think there's a question here from Dr. Dow. Yeah, don't we have to? Sorry. Thank you. I really wasn't going to ask a question. It was just that the missing element is the woman and the inequality between the woman and man through conquest because the cradle theory is talking about the balance between the woman and the man. So you essentially, by the domination and debasement and demonization of the woman, you can't really have equality mm -hmm. until that is... Dealt with, dealt with, and that's where all, according to Diop, all the problems come from the mm. first injustice. Thank you. So in the federated m mm -hmm. uh, attempt, you mm -hmm. would have to have something like bicameralism, mm -hmm. where both the voice in government over the woman and the voice of the man would come together to speak Absolutely. in a whole in a whole Absolutely. harmonious message Absolutely. and change. Absolutely. And I think that is, I think that uh, Sheikh Anta Jope uh, predicted or at least discussed that as well because the, the role of the woman is essential and it's not even, I always say it's not an act of charity that men do say, okay, you, no, no, it is a fundamental necessity. And as a fundamental necessity, that's the only way you can uh, drive toward unity. But then, of course, you have the problematic of uh, the cultural or religious differences, you see, and uh, Islam and uh, and uh, and Igbo culture are different in this respect, and and how do you deal with this uh, if you're talking about a a federated state of Africa where you have all these nations and all these ethnic communities represented? Uh, it just seems to me that there has to be a common understanding of what is African and what is not, you know. And then on top of that, of course, people can have their own individual ideas. But I think that you got to have a common base in order to have a, a government, any kind of government, we have to agree on certain things. And part of like what's happening in the United States of America is that the whole notion of the uh, social or political contract is being questioned right now by a lot of people as to whether or not this is a legitimate contract. And, uh, and I've argued that it's not even a contract because we were not involved in making the system the, the way it is. So it, it's all, th these are deep questions, but I do 
want to thank uh, Chinedu for at least having the courage to, to raise him and to bring him up. And I want to thank, again, uh, Foster Asari for bringing up the question of Galamsi uh, as it relates particularly to the illegal mining going on in Ghana, but not just in Ghana, all over Africa, where many Chinese are coming in and they are taking up uh, situations where they are uh, corrupting, in, in, in a sense, through money, uh, the local people, and going into areas digging uh, for gold or copper or whatever the ura whatever the the, the, the uh, minerals are uh, that they want, they they they're going in. And I think that uh, uh, Foster uh, uh, sorry that the the big issue is government itself that there is no accountability on the part of the leadership. I mean, you can, people can say that the local uh, leaders are allowing the uh, people to do this, but who allows the people to get visas to come in to do it? And who are the people who, who are running uh, immigration? And uh, who, who are the people who are uh, uh, purchasing the excavators? I mean, they know what excavators are coming in and they know where they're going. So the government is responsible. It's the people have to at least hold their government accountable for the things that are happening. And one last thing I wanted to say, because I think I need to say this, that we don't use, we try not to use words like pagan when we refer to Africans. And the reason we, we don't do that is because this is a, a, a Latin word from uh, the word uh, paganus, which uh, really was first used uh, by the, the Christians uh, for those people who were uh, outside of Christianity uh, in, in the Roman Empire. Uh, this is Constantine and others who call everybody else pagan. And then, of course, it was applied uh, by the Abrahamic religions uh, to people who were not uh, practicing the Abrahamic religions. They call everybody else pagan. So the African uh, people who uh, uh, practice uh, African religion or whatever those traditions are are not pagans. Uh, African people who uh, practice African religions are people who practice African religion. And that's, that's all that, that's who they are. Uh, there is no such thing as pagan unless you are a person in either Christianity or Islam who's talking about other people and you're putting a projection on them uh, when they could turn around and say the same to you that uh, if you practice Christianity, then you are pagan. If you practice uh, Islam, then you are pagan. They can say that because you said it to them because you didn't like their religion. But if they don't like your religion, they say the same thing. It means the other, the ones who are doing something that is different. So let's stay away you know, from that term. But are there any other questions? No other questions. I want to thank you all for coming. These uh, young brothers have done an incredible job, uh, and we appreciate everybody who's been here. Let's give them one more applause and thank them. And we say, uh, in the tradition of the MKA Institute, we call upon our ancestors far and near, the mother of our mothers, the father of our fathers, to render mercy, to bear witness for the liberation and the victory of all oppressed people forever. And we say, it is done. Asante san. Thank you very much, Toyosi. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.